The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Blackfire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith-Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Murrieta. Chapter 14. Stephen Glenn Weber's voice was hoarse and reverberated like an echo in some great cavern. As he rose slowly from his chair and moved toward Jordan, she screamed. She was paralyzed with fear and shock. This couldn't be happening. The man was dead. She had seen him die. Or had she? Maybe they just told her he was dead for some unexplained reason, but it didn't matter. She was staring into the face of a man who had tried to violate her. Maybe he even did it and she can't remember it. She knew she was drunk and the night was still hazy and confused in her memory. But she was sure of one thing right now. She had to get away from him. He was still walking toward her with that insidious smile. She backed away, then turned and ran. Every fiber of her being told her that she had to get away from him. But she somehow knew in this moment that this man was capable of more than rape or violation of her body. He was capable of death, of killing her, and she had to run. She headed for the one-way elevator because she could see that the sliding doors were open and she couldn't think in that moment of any other avenue of escape. Jordan charged into the elevator and as she turned to hit the buttons that would take her upward, she could see Stephen Weber moving closer, his eyes glinting maliciously. She hit the button to her floor and could hear her own voice chanting desperately, Go, go, go! The doors finally closed just before the man got there, and she was on her way upward. At the sixth floor, the doors opened, and Jordan ran out of the elevator and down the corridor to her room. Fortunately, she had remembered to put her room card into the pocket of her kimono, and she managed to get it out and slip it into the door slot. The door opened. She ran inside and slammed the door behind her. It locked automatically, and she felt safe for a moment. Then the reality of it all swept over her. The death of Cody, the bridge, the one night with Rafe, the invitation and the strange place where all the people suddenly had disappeared from sight, with the exception of one man who was supposed to be dead. She was shaking now, and emotion was welling up inside. Jordan didn't cry easily, but the tears were beginning to flow. She ran to the bedroom and collapsed on the bed, sobbing like a baby until the Sweet darkness of sleep enveloped her. Jordan awoke to sunlight streaming in from the window. Her entire body tightened with the overwhelming feeling that someone was there in the room, someone looking down at her. But as she slowly searched the room with her gaze, she could see there was no one. It was just the first light of dawn that had awakened her. Then the memories flooded into her mind and she could not decide whether she had actually awakened during the night and gone downstairs or whether it was all just a nightmare. She simply wasn't sure, but she knew she had to find out if there were people outside in the hotel. The whole idea of being alone in this place was unbearable. Quickly she gathered together a casual outfit and began to dress. The moment she stepped out into the corridor, she knew that what she had experienced during the night It was a dream. She could hear the sound of people in the distance. She rushed down the corridor toward where she remembered having ridden down to the lobby on a great curving escalator. She stared down at an escalator, but it did not curve like the one in her dream. It was beautifully modern and definitely a sleek part of this fine hotel, but it certainly was not curved. It sloped down toward the fifth floor in a straight line, just like any other escalator. Other than its powerful elegance, There was nothing unusual about it, nor was it empty. Jordan could see several people descending on it, and she was happy to join them on a ride toward the next level below. Jordan was deposited into the lobby at the final base of the escalator, and she stared around her in great relief at the number of people who were now moving in all directions. Some wore casual clothing like hers, some dressed for tennis, others moving past in riding gear. She scanned the area for some sign of the concierge Samania. The woman was nowhere to be seen. Jordan made her way through the teeming crowd, pausing for just a moment to stare up at the painting of Daniel Corinthus. 
It was the eyes once again that both frightened and fascinated her. It was a fierce and powerful gaze, the eyes a deep gray and luminous with very black pupils that seemed to burn like the black fires of hell. Jordan turned away from the painting in revulsion, found that she was looking once again at the great fountain and huge water clock that she had seen upon her arrival and had confronted in the depths of what she was certain now was just a dream. There was no trace of that sound now. The strange and horrifying tone that had awakened her and brought her down to the lobby in the disturbing nightmare. Now there was only the sound of the water rushing down the fountainhead and through the intricate systems of the clock. But then when she turned away from the fountain and the clock, she found herself staring into a room and seeing something she had not seen upon her arrival. It was something she had only seen in the dream. Yet here it was now when she was wide awake. Jordan stared into the vast side room with the massive double doors and the sign over it that designated it as Table 18. Inside the room was the enormous poker table, just like in the dream. It was carved, as she recalled it from the dream, with gargoyles and mythological creatures. Jordan stood looking at the table, stunned and unable to calculate the contradiction. She had seen this room when she arrived, but the doors were closed, and so she had not seen the great poker table within. It was only in her dream that she had seen it. So she thought with growing dread, how could it then have just been a dream? And if it wasn't a dream, then what was it? What about the curving escalator, the man she had seen? Was Weber really alive and here somewhere? She watched as a couple of people entered the room designated as Table 18. She recognized the concierge. It was Samanya who turned slightly to smile at Jordan. Jordan smiled back, but then was shocked once again to see the face of the other man who walked beside Samanya. It was Rafe Dillon who gave no sign of seeing Jordan. The pair disappeared into the room as the twin massive doors slowly closed behind them. Chapter 15. I was freaking out. It had only been seconds since I arrived at the Blackfire Resort and Casino, and I had seen Grecian columns, fucking colored hot air balloons floating in the sky and guests arriving in a sleek, powerful black and gold Hermes chopper. But I'd managed to control myself and park my car near where there was a mixed lineup of ordinary streetcars, muscle cars, and exotics like Ferraris, Maseratis, and Rolls Ghosts left unattended. I got out of my 98 Torino and walked up to the massive main hotel entrance, which was a good distance ahead of me. Even from here, the place smelled rich and loaded with everything from brass bald wealthy motherfuckers to scumbag bottom feeders. I followed a group of people who were jabbering and glancing around as if also impressed by the spectacle of their surroundings. I followed them to the front desk where I waited patiently for them while they appeared to be checking in. After a moment, one of the clerks moved to greet me and asked me if I were checking in. I told him I wasn't, but I wanted to know if a friend of mine had checked in recently. I gave the clerk the name of Father Matus. The clerk was courteous and obligingly looked up the name on his computer, found it, and told me that Father Matus was in room 231. I thought that was funny, that it was so simple to learn which room the priest was staying in, but I wasn't about to press the point. The clerk smiled politely and indicated the bank of elevators at the far end of the huge lobby foyer. I moved through crowds of people on my way to the elevator bank, glancing around like a real tourist at the strange mix of old and modern decoration, the typical rows of glittering slots, huge paintings that looked like guests from the 30s some kind of giant, weird-looking water clock, and a huge tapestry. But I really only had one thing on my mind, that I was about to face Father Matus after all this time, to finally confront the man who had abused me like a piece of meat when I was just a kid. The man who had left me with only half a life, the other half so injured that it was all I could do to go on with what was left. Well, I was about to end my long trip into the past, and my mind was focusing on what I would actually do when now I came face to face with the man whose personal crime was indelibly etched into my body and soul. 
I took the one-way elevator to the second floor, exited into this long corridor, moved swiftly to the door marked 231. I automatically gripped the handle of my FBI standard-issue Glock 22 service revolver that was nestled in its sheath just under my armpit and then pressed the digital doorbell. A moment passed, then I could hear the sound of someone approaching from inside. I tensed and prepared myself for the shock of seeing the priest once again after such a long wait. The door slowly opened, and I found myself staring at the face of a young man, maybe 30. There were the same cold eyes I remembered, the same gaunt and pale face, but it couldn't be the same fucking man. Father Matus had to be a man in his 60s. This man was far too young to be the priest of my childhood. He wasn't much older than I was. His face was young and smooth without any wrinkles, and there wasn't a sign of gray in his black, neatly waved and combed hair. He was not wearing a clerical collar, but a tweed sport jacket, a soft shirt, and beige summer slacks. It was him, but it wasn't him. I was staring at a contradiction that I couldn't explain. He stared at me curiously with no recognition. Can I help you, he asked, his voice calm and also that of a man far too young to be the priest I remembered so fucking well, yet, yet it was the same face, just younger. Could the priest have left the church married and had a son? The thoughts raced through my mind, but I let go of my Glock 22. I was looking for Father John Matus, I stammered. I'm Father Matus, the young man affirmed. I was stunned. <laughs> but the man I knew was in his 60s. I'm 32, said the young man with a smile. I stared at him narrowly, trying to decide my next move, my next question. I took out my FBI credentials and showed them to him. I know this may be an awkward question for you, but it's, it's important. Was your father also a priest? The young man shook his head slowly in the negative. My father was an accountant, a CPA. I'm sorry. What about an uncle? Any relative? I'm afraid I'm the only one in the family who ever wanted to be a priest. What's going on? Why would you be looking for an older Father Matus? I stood there staring at the man for a long moment. My reality really threatened. I was looking into the face of the man I remembered bitterly. But the man was at least 30 years younger. Now how real was that? It couldn't just be a facelift or makeup. I'd examined the man's face carefully. I could see that his flesh was young and authentic. I was stymied. I was totally fucked. There seemed to be nothing I could do at the moment. Somehow, I had to let it go. Forgive me for bothering you, Father. I, I guess I've, I've made a mistake somehow. I smiled grimly at this character who claimed to be Father Matus, looked exactly like Father Matus, but couldn't possibly be Father Matus. And then I turned and moved back down the corridor. I could feel the young man watching me go for a moment, then I heard the doors shut. Jesus Christ, was I in the midst of some fucking nightmare and didn't know it? I knew in my gut that the young man I had just seen was Father Matus. The man had even affirmed that he was Father Matus, but how could it be the same priest? And if I actually told anyone that this was the 60-year-old man who had molested me nearly 30 years ago, they'd think I was either mistaken or had lost my mind. I couldn't even kill the man in good conscience because it just didn't make sense that he was the original Father Matus. How could I take a chance? Well, then maybe it wasn't even a nightmare. Maybe I really had just gone crazy. Maybe this obsession had really, really driven me to the brink of psychosis. I was really shaken and I hardly remember going downstairs, but I ended up on a stool in one of the luxurious bars nursing a scotch on the rocks, trying to comprehend this baffling turn of events. But if I felt on the edge of darkness, the man sitting on the stool next to me was showing even more signs of it. I found out his name later and a lot of other things I'd just as soon forget. Oren Matthews was about 40, a small man with thinning hair, owlish, Harry Potter-style glasses, and an ill-fitting suit with mismatched jacket and pants. He seemed out of his element. You know, an earthy, organic type of guy. Genuine and gentle. 
He was somewhat hurriedly put together for this environment, not quite able to cope with it. But despite his rather plain and average man look, there was something in his eyes that just didn't match the man. His eyes blazed with a strange and pretty weird mix of intelligence, exultation, and fear. He was drinking too much, and he kept popping his ears gently with the palms of both hands, as if the noise in the room was bothering him, and he was angry with his own ears for tolerating it. Then he glanced over at me, while I was looking at him, and smiled sheepishly. He dropped his hands to the bar, and his latest drink in a kind of awkward and embarrassed reaction to being caught popping his ears. Tinnitus, he said, smiling crookedly. You know what that is? Ringing in the ears, right? Yeah, some people call it buzzing. Others whispering or even singing. Doctors used to offer all kinds of strange cures. The Assyrians poured rose extract into the ear through a bronze tube. The Roman writer Pliny the Elder suggested that earthworms boiled in goose grease be put into the ear. Medieval Welsh physicians in the town of Midfi recommended that their patients take a freshly baked loaf of bread out of the oven, cut it in two, and apply to both ears as hot as can be borne, bind, and thus produce perspiration, and by the help of God you will be cured. <laughs> I'm sorry to be going on like this, he apologized to me. But you see, I know things now that I didn't know before, and I'm afraid I'm showing off. But the truth is, I should have wagered losing the tinnitus instead of asking to know everything. I beg your pardon. I stopped my glass in midair and stared at Oren. What the hell did he just say? Oren continued with hardly a second's hesitation. Of course, I'm not supposed to talk about that kind of wagering. It's verboten. But what good is knowing things when you can't tell anybody how you came about it? Anyway, I've still got the ringing in my ears. Now he really took notice of my baffled expression and stared at me for a moment, examining my face and my eyes in particular. Alarm bells were going off in my head. You probably think I'm a little crazy, right? I can understand that. But the fact is, I'm still just a bit overwhelmed by it all. Didn't believe it for a minute, actually. But it's true. I know things. I know things about you, for instance. I know the man you just saw upstairs is actually the real Father Matus. Chapter 16 Now, if I had been the kind of guy who dropped his jaw in astonishment, I would have dropped my fucking jaw all the way to the floor in this moment, but I could only stare at Oren in total bewilderment. How do you know that, I ask, nearly spilling my drink. Like I said, I know things, to be exact. I believe I know, or will know, just about everything. Oren was grinning now like a man who had just recently won a huge lottery. There was a glow in his eyes of satisfaction and triumph. Have you been following me? I asked, anger and accusation darkening my voice. No, I haven't been following you, Rafe. I just know things. How do you know my name? I demanded, the scotch blurring only some of the anger. Oren glanced around cautiously, then whispered to me confidentially seeming to both enjoy his curious ability and yet being fearful of it. I know all about you, Rafe. You're with the FBI and you've been searching for Father Matus to either bring him to justice or punish him yourself, but you can't do either because he's 30 years younger than what you expected him to be. So, in order to prove that he is the original, you need to gather some DNA and send it off to your friend Bert, who can have it analyzed at the main FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. Now you'll have to excuse me because I have to find my wife. She's in the casino and I wanted to have a couple of drinks before I gave her the good news. Before I could gather myself together and absorb what the fuck Oren had just rattled off in a few seconds, the man had slipped off the bar stool and disappeared into the crowd of people filing in and out of the lavish saloon. I finally managed to snap out of my stunned state of disbelief and total bewilderment. I charged after Oren, but was unable to spot him in the milling people. Shaken even further than I had been earlier by my encounter with the younger father, Matus, I was really beginning to doubt my own sanity. What the hell was going on here? Well, I had to find this little man and learn how he knew the things he said. But at the same time, I was growing increasingly alarmed by the total unreality of what was happening. I knew I was a damaged man, but I had still prided myself on my logical mind. 
Even though I was well aware it was wrong pursuing my own personal vendetta, I still somehow always felt that I was, well, never in denial about what I was doing. I had convinced myself that even though it was wrong, and I knew it was wrong, I was always still approaching it with my same practiced logic and my feet firmly planted on the ground. Revenge certainly had a quality of wild justice, but it still remained in the world of reality. Now somehow, I not only was a damaged man, but also seemed to be someone bordering on insanity. The only thing that kept me from going over the edge was the cell phone in my pocket. It was my connection to the outside world, my fucking umbilical cord to reality. And I thought about calling someone, anyone, to tell them what had been happening to me. But what would I have told them? It was all just so insane. Nobody would have believed me, not even Jordan. The very nature of my orderly universe had suddenly become threatened and under attack. But there was one fact that I couldn't deny. Despite all the bizarre bullshit, this strange little man had made some real sense that totally contradicted all the other craziness. Despite the spurious and unnatural fact of Father Matus being 30 years younger than he should be, the idea of checking out his DNA was logical and possible. Even if I was actually going mad and didn't realize it, I still saw this as a simple and logical step that might not prove anything, but could at least give me a course to follow that was reasoned and sensible under the circumstances. I hurried to the front desk, asked if there was a way that I could send a package out through the mail. The young man at the desk assured me that mail and packages were being sent out and received by helicopter twice daily. If I would bring whatever I wanted to send to the desk, they would see that it was shipped immediately free of charge as part of the hotel's policy. I found that nicety somewhat strange since I wasn't a guest, but then everything I had been experiencing recently had been strange. I then asked if there was a pharmacy in the hotel, and I was directed toward it. Once at the pharmacy, I bought a couple of small plastic containers and a padded mailing envelope. Then I went up to the second floor again. There are tools every FBI special agent had at his disposal for entering hotel rooms, but this hotel had unusual locks on the doors, and I didn't want to leave any traces of having been there. Besides, there were cleaning services people who were always working the rooms. I approached a young woman who had just come out of another room with her cleaning equipment. I showed her my ID and asked her to check and see if the occupant of 231 was still in his room. She pressed the room buzzer, and we waited for a few moments. I then asked her to open the door and allow me to enter, making sure that she realized she would be in trouble if she revealed that I had been there. Moments later, I was moving through the young Father Matusa's rooms. Like the rest of the hotel, the rooms were vast and lush. I couldn't help thinking again that it was curious a hotel like this needed to provide free two-week stays as part of any promotional effort. But I was well aware that it was all about gambling and that all casino hotels provided some kind of promotion to lure customers. I still couldn't quite account for their inviting someone to gamble who was a priest, having seen the telegraph that identified Father Matus. But my logical mind surmised that perhaps the guests were selected at random by computer and the priest had somehow slipped through. My logical mind. <laughs> what a fucking laugh that was becoming. But I kept my mind on the job, was swift and professional, silently moving to trash containers and retrieving any nail clippings I could find. Then I was at the bed and searching for loose hair, and then on to the bathroom where I picked up a toothbrush and the loose residue of hair from a hairbrush. I had seen this kind of brush before. It was a Kent, one of the world's finest brushes, handmade with rubber cushion and ergonomic styling. Instantly, a small piece of my reality snapped back. Some of the hair at the deeper level of the bristle was white. The hair closer to the outer levels of the bristle was dark. Okay, so that may have meant that the young Father Matus might have used some form of trickery to change his appearance. But I, I was still a long ways from proving my own sanity. Even if the DNA matched, what about Oren Matthews? But I had to stick to one thing at a time. Downstairs, at a table in the saloon, 
I quickly packaged the items found in Father Matusa's room and wrote Bert's name and address at the FBI field office in Reno on the address label. I took the package to the front desk, gave it to the young man I had talked to earlier, who assured me that it would go out in the evening mail. I then went outside the hotel and stared upward at the colorful hot air balloons passing overhead as I dialed Bert in Reno on his cell phone. I explained to Bert as much as I could without the details that would have confirmed I was going crazy. Bert said he would get the items off to Quantico as soon as he received them. But when I told him where I had gotten the items, Bert's voice became confused and skeptical. Your where? Bert asked me to repeat the name of the resort as if he had never heard of it. The Black Fire Resort and Casino in the Virgin Valley. It's kind of remote, but amazing. I've never seen anything like it before. Rafe, are you smoking something? Okay, so you've never heard of the Black Fire Resort. I said it's kind of remote. Rafe, I know the Virgin Valley. I lived in Reno and Vegas for years. There's nothing there but desert, opal mines, and cactus. I've hiked and dune buggied that whole area. There's nothing there. Chapter 17 What the hell was Bert talking about? Bert, I'm standing right here outside the biggest fucking hotel I've ever seen. It's one of several hotels and casinos. There's a lake and boats. I'm looking up at balloons floating overhead. What the fuck do you think I'm doing? Hallucinating the whole thing? But it can't be, man. I'm on the computer right now and I've Googled the name. There's nothing. Nothing on MapQuest. <laughs> this is kind of weird. I went ballistic. I've been holding it in ever since I got here, and now my best friend was sending me over the edge. Don't tell me there's nothing here. Fuck you, it's here. You're telling me it's weird? It's more than weird, Bert. It's more than fucking weird. I can't explain any of it, but there's, there's something going on here that's driving me crazy. God damn it, get me the fucking DNA feedback. Okay, okay, Rafe, take it easy. I'll get to work on it the minute I get it. I'm going to run this through CODIS and a couple of other sources. Okay, okay, but don't forget my DNA feedback. Now, I'll talk to you later. After we hung up, my, my growing sense of unease was becoming a kind of visceral thing, a fear in my gut like nothing I'd ever known before. Bert had always been rock solid in his information and in his analysis of even the most bizarre crimes. He was always the go-to guy for straight talking, near perfect forensic presentation. If he said there was no Black Fire Resort, uh, this was all just desert, my first instinct was to believe him. But that would mean I'd be forced to deny my own senses. I'd always trusted Bert, and he was the only one in whom I had confided my obsession concerning Father Matus. I knew that Bert, even in his loyalty to the FBI, would never out me. Bert had a similar experience when he was a kid, and he understood where I was coming from. He had been covering for me for over two years, but even a guy like Bert could still be wrong. <laughs> Nobody was perfect. But certain facts still remain. I hadn't even told my best friend the truth of what was happening here. Then I, I wasn't even sure just what was happening. I, I only knew that somewhere in all this wacky fruitcake of experience, there was a germ of truth that I was missing. <sighs> Maybe I just made a mistake in my own perception of the truth. But whatever the case, I was coming to the basic conclusion that no matter what was going on, I needed to stay here and wait for Bert to get that DNA feedback to me. It might take a, a day and it might take several days. Believe me, I was, I was getting itchy to get back to Jordan, to hold her in my arms, maybe, maybe build a life with her. But for now, I needed a place to crash and play this out. Maybe a couple of hours of downtime might help my perspective. It was in that moment she spoke to me. May I help you? She introduced herself to me as I stared at her in a kind of speechless awe. Samanya was one of those women who could give any man an instant rush of adrenaline. In simple terms, she was just plain gorgeous with luminous eyes, copper gold skin, and an amazing body. She was smiling at me with the oldest expression known to man was woman's way of communicating both seductive interest and alluring and unavoidable mystery. 
It was impossible for me to avoid the magnetism of those eyes and the sultry tones of her voice. If you'd like to extend your stay, I'm sure it can be arranged. Just follow me to the front desk, and I'll be happy to see to it that you are accommodated. It was as if she had heard my thinking. <laughs> but of course, that was impossible. Just chalk it up to another adventure in serendipity. Like a man in a trance, I followed Samanya back into the hotel. She said something to the young man at the desk, which I didn't catch. But within a few seconds of his getting on the computer, I was registered at the hotel. As she was leading me toward the bank of elevators, I asked her how she knew my name. She just glanced at me, smiled, and said she saw my name on the package I had sent to Bert earlier. Noting my reaction, she just smiled again and said she knew everything that went on at this hotel and that I could sign the register later. Actually, I don't think I would have been surprised to learn that she could read minds. I just hoped she wasn't reading mine about now as I watched the way her incredible body moved in those tight slacks. I was to learn shortly after that she just might have been reading my mind after all. Welcome to the House of Addiction, Samanya quipped sardonically as I stood staring around me at room 345 moments later, which wasn't a room in any sense of the word. If anything, it was a suite of rooms like nothing I had ever languished in before. I can hardly even describe it, but I was almost immediately drawn to what she had just said to me. You, you talking about these rooms? <laughs> I bet it would be hard to leave, but I can't afford it. She moved a little closer to me, still smiling enigmatically. I wasn't talking about the rooms. I was talking about the casino. Oh, I, I don't have a problem. I, I know when to quit. She reached out her long fingertips, touched my tie, fondled it as if she approved, then she flicked it playfully. Gamblers are born liars. It was more than a tease. It was a direct challenge, and I wasn't about to let it slip by. Your looks give you a lot of liberty. She was really close now, and this provocative woman's perfume was making me dizzy. My looks get me a lot of invitations. You came here without one. Well, I make my own invitations. I suppose the law allows you that. I guess you got that from the package, too. No, you showed your ID to a guest and to one of the service workers. There are no secrets here. I have nothing to hide from the FBI. Did you find what you were looking for? Not exactly. I had this sudden and powerful impulse to spill out all the strange things that had been happening to me here, but I suppressed the feeling. Trust was not something I felt inclined to give to Samanya just yet. Her smile by now was definitely not enigmatic. It was a killer smile. I was a target. She slipped her arms up around my neck. She was offering herself to me. Maybe you should start looking at other possibilities. Somebody once said, God planted fear in the soul as truly as he planted hope or courage. It's a kind of bell or gong which brings the mind into quick life and avoidance at the approach of danger. My bells and gongs were going off like crazy. Ever seen pictures of exquisite snakes, cobras, black mambas? Their beauty is only matched by their perilous nature. I reached up and took her wrists in my hands, pulled them down from around my neck. Maybe we should get to know each other better. Her laugh was like broken glass chimes in a gentle breeze. It was slightly off key. I'm sorry if I embarrassed you. I hope you enjoy your stay with us. Then her smile disappeared and her face darkened. Just remember, Rafe, like I said, there are no secrets here. We know what you want and why you want it. But we decide if you can have it. Good night. She was out the door before I even had a chance to compute that last little zinger. I stood there in the middle of that huge salon, trying to figure this whole thing out, to somehow make sense of what I knew was senseless. Each moment here in this so-called paradise Bert had said didn't even exist, I seemed to be slipping further and further from reality. I couldn't get hold of anything that I could look at and say, yes, this is substantial, this is real. Oh, Samanya seemed real enough, more than real. 
a woman of extraordinary charm and capacity who had everything, looks, brains, and the ability to make you feel like she could crush you under her spiked heel just about any time she felt the need. And she was just the concierge. What the fuck was the management going to be like? Okay, okay, I admit it. I was getting a bit paranoid. Wouldn't you by now? Chapter 18 My head hurt like blazes and my stomach was empty. I hadn't eaten for hours. So I left the room and went back downstairs, going first to the pharmacy to pick up some aspirin, then to the dining room to get something to eat. The dining room was just as fucking sumptuous as the rest of the place, and the food was about as good as you could find any place in the world. But as I was sitting, finishing up my dinner of chicken Kiev, I caught a glimpse of the little man who knew everything, sitting by himself at a table near the far end of the room. I quickly signed the check and moved to catch him as he was also about to leave. I was chasing him through the lobby area when my cell phone went off. I stopped to answer it, reacting as Bert began talking through what appeared to be heavy static. I moved quickly to the entrance to get a better reception outside, but there was still strong interference. I could barely understand what Bert was saying, but what I did hear sent me into a further decline. He was telling me that he had first checked the DNA samples I had sent him in their own analysis lab before sending them on to Quantico. Bert thought it would save time if he could get a result from their lab. What are you talking about, Bert? I just sent you the samples less than an hour ago. You couldn't have gotten the results already. What are you talking about, Bert said quickly. You called me yesterday and I got the DNA samples this morning. I've been working on it all day. What the hell was going on? Was I losing it completely or was Bert playing some kind of sick joke on me? This was still the same day I had arrived at the Blackfire Resort and I had just sent him the priest's DNA sample before Samanya had taken me to my room. Sure, my brain was twisted in 50 different directions and Bert had been adamant about the fact that the resort didn't even exist but he was also telling me that fucking time didn't exist as well. The static over my cell was making it more difficult to hear and I could barely understand Bert anymore, but I heard enough to know that what he had just told me wasn't even the worst of it. Bert went on to say that they had gotten a result all right, but the DNA samples I had sent him all proved to be my own. That's right, the samples I had pulled from the young, Father Matusa's room, nails, hair, it was all my DNA. I was stunned, disbelieving, and I yelled at him that they obviously made a mistake, but Bert was adamant and checked it twice and came up with the same results. He started saying that maybe I had made some kind of mistake and accidentally got the samples mixed up with my own. Why the fuck would I send my own hair? I yelled into the phone, but the static had gotten worse and I don't think he even heard me. The connection was deteriorating, the static was turning into some other sound, something that sounded like a distant moaning, like a group of crazy people in great agony. Then it went dead. No sound. Nothing. I yelled a couple of hellos, but there was nothing. My fingers trembling slightly as I ended the call, I, I felt like I was sinking further into some kind of an abyss where nothing was adding up and I was on my own in the twilight zone. I felt paralyzed. For the moment, I was cut off from the real world, desperately trying to cling to some kind of logic. I spotted Oren Matthews as he approached the restrooms. He appeared to be somewhat more distressed and agitated than he was earlier. He still occasionally popped his ears with the palms of his hands, and he smiled weakly at me as I approached. Okay, so maybe he was a nutcase. But he had known about Father Matus, and even though his source of Information seemed to be coming from outer space. At least he was flesh and blood and familiar. Maybe I could get something a little more plausible from him. But I might as well have been asking for Amy Winehouse to appear singing Rehab. Oran Matthews began to tell me what I already knew, and how he knew it, I didn't have a clue. He said he knew that my own DNA was going to come back from Bert because they didn't want anybody to know the truth. And why send me on a wild fucking goose chase? Maybe Oren just wanted to keep me around, but for what I had no clue, I stood there like walking dead, listening to him go on to tell me that Father Matus had become younger in the same way that 
Orrin Matthews had become able to know everything. At that point, I, I wanted to clap my hand over his mouth instead of his ears. I wanted to kick his ass, but I just stood there listening to all his bullshit. The last thing he said was that I, I couldn't kill Father Matus because they wouldn't let me. I was just managing to come up with a very weak, who the fuck are they, when he decided against going to the bathroom. He hustled quickly away without so much as another word to me. I felt sick to my stomach, and it wasn't from the chicken Kiev. At this point, I knew that I had only two real choices left. I could walk out the doors to my car and get the hell out of here forever. Really good choice. Or I could confront Father Matus one more time and push him. Maybe I wouldn't put him over the edge, but maybe just enough to satisfy myself one way or the other. Either he was the original Father Matus, or he wasn't. He was going to have to come up with some really solid facts to prove that he definitely was not the original, or I was going to take him down just to make myself feel better. I needed a shock to my system that would snap me out of all this shit. There's never been anything quite like putting a hole in a man to awaken you to reality. Every fucking kind of cop or soldier knew that. Chapter 19. The young Father Matus opened the door and regarded me with a look of resignation. I was expecting you back, he said quietly, retreating slightly to allow me to enter. I moved inside and he shut the door. I had the immediate feeling that it wasn't going to take much to get the truth. He seemed like a troubled man, very much in need of unloading. But as I stared at his hawk face, I could barely tolerate my own feelings of revulsion and hate. I didn't know yet for sure whether he was the man who was the cause of it, but I somehow knew, deep inside, that the next few moments were going to throw me further into the abyss than I could imagine. He began to talk, and I began to feel my sanity slipping away again. I wanted to kill him right then and there when he confessed that he was the actual Father Matus who had abused me as a child. But I could only stand there in total disbelief as he related how he had once been a man of 62 who had only wanted to start over again. He had thought that he could rid himself of the sins he had committed by simply starting over, by becoming young again. He had never really thought it was possible, didn't believe it when he first came to the resort. But he had simply asked for it to happen, and it did. One minute he was that 62-year-old sinner, and the next he was a young man, totally changed physically from what he had been before. <laughs> was it me going crazy, or had I merely slipped into a madhouse by mistake? I couldn't begin to believe what he was saying. It, was just, it just wasn't possible for an old man to become young again. It's funny what you think of at moments like this, I remembered when I was a kid reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I'd seen the movie that was made from it with Brad Pitt. It was about a man being born old and living backward to childhood. It was a pretty good movie. But it was just a story. It couldn't really happen. Not in my world. But that's what this young man was claiming, that he had gone backward from a middle-aged man to a young man of 30 by just asking to start over. Asking who? Santa Claus? Give me a fucking break. Well, it really wasn't all that crazier than the other stuff I had been seeing and hearing. But the young priest wasn't through fucking up my world. He went on to say that he had become young again, thinking that would solve everything, that he could start a new and better life. But it hadn't changed everything. It hadn't really cleansed him of his sins. It was still there. At first, I had no idea what he meant by that. It was still there. What the hell was still there? I shouldn't have asked. I shouldn't even have stayed in that room. I should have gotten the hell out with just some part of my mind left intact. But what he went on to tell me was that the urges were still there. His face and body had changed and become younger which was what he asked for. But the urges he had about children had stayed with him. 
He looked despicably pitiable as he went on moaning. He still couldn't control his desires, his need to fondle children. His eyes now were the same as I remembered them. Young, old, it didn't matter. And they were lit by the same black fires of some loathsome, depraved appetite. I couldn't take any more of this shit. Standing right in front of me was none other than the man I had been obsessing about since I was ten years old. The old man who had become young again and the priest of my nightmares. It all came back to me in that moment. I could feel his nauseating closeness, his hands all over me, his breath stinking of wine and garlic. I didn't give a fuck whether he was the old Father Matus or the young one. It didn't matter. He was still a sick motherfucker, and I knew what I had to do. I couldn't turn him in. They'd think I was nuts, but I had to stop him before he abused some other innocent, vulnerable little kid. My Glock 22 service revolver was in my hand before I could even think further about it. All the despicable memories of that man and what he had done to me were flooding into my head, and I, I could no more control myself right then than I could control a moving train. I hated the man with a fury that could not be restrained. The priest cried out and cringed. I pointed the revolver at his head, aimed right between his eyes, and pulled the trigger. But nothing happened. The Glock wouldn't fire. I pulled the trigger again and again, but it just wouldn't fire. I was really going nuts. I checked the weapon carefully, but there was nothing wrong with it. The young, old Father Matus was standing still and staring at me, the terror that had filled his eyes turning to something else, some kind of realization that was entering into my mind as well. I remembered what the little man had said about the fact that they wouldn't let me kill him. Bullshit. The fucking revolver wouldn't fire. There was more than one way to skin a cat. I'd club the son of a bitch to death. I lifted the Glock like a hammer, and I knew it was plenty heavy enough to do the job. I lunged at the priest with real intent to do bodily harm. But as I brought the weapon down on his head, his head suddenly wasn't there. No, I don't mean his head had disappeared. I mean he had completely disappeared. He just wasn't in the same spot he had been when I struck at him. I whirled around and saw him standing in another place across the room. I couldn't believe it. Nobody could have moved that fast. Nobody human, that is. But then I remembered something that gorgeous, hot concierge had said just before she left my suite. There are no secrets here. We know what you want and why you want it. But we decide if you can have it. That was the moment when the truth swept over me like a cold shower. I was into something that was way over my head. I had to stop charging after answers and solutions like a bull in a china shop. I wasn't getting anywhere trying desperately to cling to my world of so-called reality and logic. It seemed all logic as I had known it had been corrupted by this place. I really was in the twilight zone, and instead of fighting against it, I might as well give in to it. My body shaking, my face running with cold sweat, I stuck the impotent revolver back in its sheath and walked out the door, leaving Father Matus, both young and old, with a look of relief and triumph. On the other hand, I felt like shit. I hadn't really cried since I was a kid, but I felt like crying now. I felt like I was 10 years old again, abandoned and abused, a deep and depressive loneliness sweeping over me. I headed back to my suite for a real cold shower and some escape into sleep. I was more than tired. I felt beaten and on the verge of some kind of total breakdown. I don't even remember the shower, but I'm sure it offered some relief. What I do remember was the nightmare. At least it felt like a nightmare. I'm still not sure just what it was, except that it was awful. Some kind of delusion or whatever. I just, I just know that I seemed to wake up from a heavy sleep to a strange sound, like something close to me in my bed, something that was definitely not human. My eyes opened slowly, and my heart froze in instant terror at the thing that hovered just above my head. It looked like a snake, a fucking snake with its coffin-shaped head weaving in the air above me. It had a brownish-gray body with a light belly and brownish scales along its back. I stared at it in total shock. My pulse raced and my eyes widened with disbelief and fear. 
Its massive mouth was yawning, stretching into a dark, endless pit, the lining of which was purple-black with razor fangs gleaming like curved white icicles. It had a malicious tongue that was forked, protruding, and darted back and forth as if sensing the air around its head. But as its mouth closed slightly and its head came down toward me, I could see that the goddamn snake had only one eye in the center of its head. One fucking eye. I stared at it, perplexed, fixated. I was unable to move. I, I couldn't believe it. It had just one eye that was shaped round like a large and precious gemstone. There was a brilliant pinfire at its center, and it flashed iridescent colors as the head of the snake moved slightly. I could hardly breathe, let alone move. I was even terrified that any slight trembling of my body might cause the weird bastard to strike. But it, it didn't strike. It just once again opened that god-awful ink-black maw of a mouth and made more of the ugly sound that had awakened me. It was like a foul voice that scrambled around in my head, at first a murmuring, whispering, wretched voice, then one that howled repulsively and spoke at the same time with unintelligible words that fucking reeked of evil. Then I thought, or imagined, I made out some of the weird, hollow words. Kiss the postman. Jesus, it made no sense. It was just frightening and revolting. Then it was as though the voice turned into some kind of hellish laughter that bounced around the bedroom. My body shook uncontrollably. I could feel my face twist and curdle into a mask, the muscles beneath the flesh contorting and cramping with fear. Never before had I ever felt such overwhelming and compelling desire to just die, to escape from a horror in life that I could never have imagined. Then it was gone. In an instant, the one-eyed snake had fucking vanished, just an echo of that laughter dying down in my mind, and I was lying alone in bed, twisted into a kind of recoiling position, covered in damp sweat, my head aching as if struck by something heavy and solid. It was the worst nightmare I'd ever had, and I figured it had to be a nightmare because light was streaming into the room now through the sheer curtains and the huge glass windows. I was awake, if not fully aware, and there was no sound except the high-pitched doorbell. I slowly reached out, grabbed the white terry cloth hotel bathrobe lying at the foot of my bed, threw it on, kind of hobbled to the door like a man with a bad hangover. I was still shaken and trying to pull myself together from the night fright ordeal. I opened the door, and there she was again, Samanya, the vixen concierge, grinning and holding a tray with a steaming pot of coffee and a single cup. Good morning. I hope you slept well. I thought you might like some coffee before you met Daniel. I was in a slightly less than pleasant mood. Who the hell is Daniel? Daniel Corinthus is the manager of the Blackfire Resort. He would like to meet you. Can you be dressed and in the lobby in half an hour? Why does he want to meet me? I think it's really the other way around. You need to meet him because he will be able to provide all the answers you want. Half an hour. She handed me the tray, then swept off down the corridor like she was on ice skates. I went back into the room and poured myself a cup of coffee. My hands were still trembling. At this point, I couldn't care less about any answers. I just wanted to get out of this place and damned fast. But I knew down deep in my bowels that I wasn't going anywhere unless they wanted me to whoever the fuck they were. More like 40 minutes later, I was dressed and coming out of the elevator into the lobby. She was standing there like she was expecting me to arrive at that moment. She was still grinning as she took my arm and led me off through the lobby. Daniel will meet us at table 18, she informed me confidentially as if I had any idea what that meant or what table 18 was. It was early, but there were plenty of people playing the slots and some dressed like they were heading to various activities. The two cups of coffee I'd swallowed in a hurry hadn't been enough to clear my head, and I felt far less than my usual sense of confidence. One day and one night at the Blackfire Resort had beaten the shit out of me, 
and I really just wanted out of this place. But I went right along with Samanya like I was on a leash. She led me to these huge double doors and a private casino room marked as Table 18. We went inside, and the doors closed behind us. I swear to Christ, I was still so shaken, I wasn't quite sure whether we were going to be playing poker or I was going to be turned into a fucking frog. Chapter 20 Jordan felt frustrated and uncertain. She had seen Rafe go into the room marked as Table 18 with the concierge. But now she was locked out, and a digital sign on the door read, Game in progress, do not disturb. Apparently it was some kind of private game, and she would have to wait for him to come out. But she really wasn't sure she even wanted to wait for him. She was still confused about that night in Rafe's hotel room. She'd been with other men who had failed to perform for one reason or another. She was sophisticated enough to know these things happened. He had assured her that it wasn't because of her, and she had wanted to believe him, but it still felt somehow she had allowed herself to be taken advantage of by another man. She had liked him, trusted him, and he had treated her like all the others. Rafe's notes said he had left and come to the Virgin Valley apparently because of his job, because he was chasing someone. But Jordan still wasn't certain just why she was here. Yes, she had gotten the strangely coincidental invitation from the Blackfire Resort, promising an incredible free vacation. But she certainly had never thought about it as any kind of a vacation. She was still half out of her mind from the loss of Cody. She had been about to end it all on the Golden Gate Bridge. But then there was the strange and still unanswered seeming resurrection of Elaine Custer. Right after that, the invitation had come, implying that answers might be found here at the Blackfire Resort. It had intrigued her. Elaine and her husband had been here at the same resort between the time Jordan had seen Elaine dead at the hospital and the time she had appeared alive on the bridge. Was it all just synchronicity? Could it all be just coincidences on top of coincidences? Jordan knew in her heart there was more to it. But what? She was drawn away from the closed doors of Table 18 to another poker casino at another end of the vast lobby. Curious, she moved to the casino and looked in where it was quickly apparent that someone was really winning big. A short, average-looking man with shrewd, calculating eyes was at a table with an enormous collection of high-value chips in front of him. He apparently had just won another super pot with a straight flush and the crowd was cheering his amazing ongoing poker skills and luck. But Oren Matthews didn't need skills or luck. He simply knew everything. He knew the cards that were coming, and he knew the way each player was going to use them. Winning was just the result of his knowledge, and it was something he was using to please and impress the onlookers who were sweeping in all his winning chips for him with great delight and enthusiasm. Then Oren, who knew everything, suddenly glanced up toward Jordan, who was now standing closer to the table. He smiled knowingly at her, asked the dealer to deal him out of the next game. Jordan was totally confused by the big winner's sudden interest in her. She thought perhaps that he was mistaking her for someone else as he approached her and smiled again as if he were an old friend. She could hardly believe it when he began talking to her as if he knew everything about her. He seemed to know that she was now waiting for Rafe to come out of the Table 18 room. Oren assured her that he knew Rafe quite well and was aware of the relationship between Rafe and Jordan. But he appeared mostly intent on letting Jordan know that while she might not believe what he could tell her about her son Cody, there was someone up in her room right now who would be able to provide answers for her that she could believe. His words had flowed out like a happy machine gun, rapid and to the point. Oren then quickly grinned confidentially and whispered that he had to get back to the game because he was finally able to be the man his wife had always wanted. Jordan was certain the little man was quite mad. But he had seemed so confident, so absolutely convincing in the things he had said. It somehow was difficult to completely dismiss him. 
there was a flush of anger and pain when he had mentioned Cody. How the hell could this crazed, complete stranger know about her son? And what in the world did he mean about somebody up in her room who could provide answers that she could believe? She was beginning to feel even more deeply overwhelmed and dismayed by all that had happened and was continuing to happen to her. She felt increasingly more alone and vulnerable. It felt even worse now than when she was standing alone on the Golden Gate Bridge late that night. She was feeling again that all-consuming desolation and desire to end this existence that seemed determined to torture her continually and beyond endurance. It was, however, as though she could not now control the impulse to go up to her room. More obsessed than curious, she had to somehow understand what was happening. Jordan was frightened and baffled by it all, but she was also stubbornly determined that she was going to get some answers no matter what the cost. She was trembling and apprehensive as she left the elevator on her floor and headed down the long corridor to her suite. If there was actually someone in her room who could supply some real answers to all the questions roiling around in her brain, then she was going to give them a chance to tell her what they knew. But she still was skeptical and only marginally convinced that the little man who seemed to know everything was anything more than an unbalanced and very lucky card player. Jordan was well prepared for her suite to be empty of anyone as she entered and turned on the lights. She was beginning to feel extremely foolish that she had given any credence to what the demented poker winner had told her. Well, maybe it was all some kind of a scam or setup that she just hadn't as yet been able to recognize. She had been a dealer in some of the biggest casinos in Vegas. She had seen all kinds of scams and so-called winning schemes. She had to be sharp and tough and savvy for the job she held. She had always prided herself on her rock-solid cynicism. Now she could only figure it had to be the trauma of losing her son that made her vulnerable and unable to detect the truth of all this craziness. But all her attempts to stay on top of things, to stay logical and realistic, suddenly collapsed as she stared ahead of her at the figure of a man who emerged from the shadows inside the living room of her suite. It was him again, Stephen Glenn Weber, the man she knew was dead and had dreamed she saw alive. But she wasn't dreaming now, and he was standing there in the middle of her suite. Jordan was paralyzed and completely unable to comprehend what was going on. This couldn't be happening, she thought. Yet there he was. He was smiling, but not in any hostile or predatory way. It appeared to be the smile of a different kind of man. His smile was soft, almost kindly. His hands came up, palms toward her in a kind of conciliatory gesture. His voice was gentle and reassuring. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. Just get out, Jordan managed to utter grimly. I will. Just give me a minute. It's the least you can do for somebody who's come back to life. <laughs> you can't be the same person. Well, in a way, you're right. I'm not exactly the same. Coming back changed me. Stop that, Jordan flared wildly. You weren't dead. Come on, Jordan. You know it's true. Just like Elaine Custer. Remember her? She was dead, and she came back in the same way. No, 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 it's bullshit, Jordan backed away toward the door, but he followed her. It wasn't in any threatening way, but he seemed determined to convince her of the veracity of what he was saying. Jordan, I just want you to understand. I owe you that much for what I put you through before I died. I know it all sounds crazy, but it's true. They can bring people back to life. They can do anything they want. Don't you get what I'm saying? They could bring Cody back. 